and all the Adventists are sitting on the back row. Amen. Mm -hmm. We say, I get there early to get a back row seat. That's right. I think that's what it is today. That's what it is today. Okay, so um, I, what, if Jay's here, we're going to ask him any difficult questions. It was really good um, sermon this morning, really thought provoking, really clarified a lot of things. So if there's any question, I think we should have a, a period of question and answer. And then after that, I, I really want us to finish um, Philadelphia because I don't think we finished it last, last time we were here. And then um, hopefully, because I want to get into Laodicea. Okay. Um, before we do that, let's bow our heads, close our eyes, and invite the presence of God's Holy Spirit. Our Father God, we cannot learn without you. Um, we are children lost in the dark without your guiding light. So we pray for your presence. We pray, dear Lord, that you will grant us the presence of your Holy Spirit to point out the way in which we should work and walk. Your promise is that we will hear a voice behind us saying, this is the way, walk ye in it. And we want to hear that voice. We want to know what we need to know and be able to discern truth from error. We pray, the Lord, that we will hunger and thirst after righteousness, after your pure truth, your pure word. So as we come together today, as we discuss, we know, the Lord, that you impart in your, your Holy Spirit to everyone. And we may have thoughts and ideas that uh, we would want to share. I pray, the Lord, that we will have the courage to share them so that we can all learn together. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, so I'm just going to invite you to use the microphone. We have Joel here who he kind of runs around with the microphone, then he forgets, and then he, we call him back and whatever. Okay, so he's going to come and do it now. I don't know where my, my other daughter is. I, I, I have two ch three children. I only can see two. I'm giving you back to your grandmother. Ha. <laughs> Okay, so any questions from this morning? We talked about the divinity of Christ, divinity of Christ, and we're going to have to invite Jay back to come and talk about the divinity of the Spirit. Okay. You to raise your hands. Okay, so here we go. Been a... Speaking to the microphone. Uh, so oh, I have a question, but I was oh. waiting on you. <laughs> okay. I think I think Jay wants to invite us to pray. So this is this is going to be a reality for the remnant people of God. Okay. The remnant people of God are going to encounter demonic forces. So we need to be very comfortable with the power of prayer, because we are no match for demonic forces. And so we need, you know, as, as the Spirit of God is withdrawn from the world, there'll be more people who are under the control of demons. You know, do do you remember that that young man in Florida who drove down from Gainesville, drove to Frostproof, and then stabbed his mother seventy two times? Yeah. You remember that? That's a demon. That's a demon. That's a demon possessed that young boy to do that. Okay, we're going to see more and more of it. So um, we need to be very very comfortable with the power of prayer and turning to God at all times. Okay. So I'm glad we had this experience together as a group. Okay, so I think Jay's on the just talking to the family right now. Okay, but you can ask your question and Sister Pat will answer it. <laughs> okay, what's your question? Well, my question about this morning was um, the people who are preaching this um, 
God is, Jesus is not part of the Godhead, are they also deniers of LNG White and Spirit Proxy? Yeah, that's a good question. I think from the video that he, he, he showed of those two guys from Amazing Facts and, and Secrets and Sealed, these, those two pastors, they were, I think they were still quoting Spirit of Prophecy. Do you want to do you want to speak into the microphone? Because to... yes, whenever I've heard somebody present this argument, they've always taken things, energy White's writings out of context, and they'll cherry pick the things that they want to um, share that they feel support their view. And so it's not that they've not used it; it's just that they've misinterpreted it or used it in an incorrect way. Okay. My question was related. Uh, are these two misguided gentlemen still part of the church in good and regular standing? Probably not. I think Jay answered that earlier. He said they were not. One guy was affiliated with Amazing Facts. Amazing Facts. And one, one was the Secrets Unlimited. So let's get it into let's get let's the other get, one was uh, Stephen Bohr's organization. The other man was Secrets and Sealed. Yeah, Secrets. And Sealed. Okay, yeah. So Sister Mary, because you weren't here this morning, it's a really great sermon about the divinity of Jesus Christ, and um, because there's a you know, in the last days, Mrs. White says there'll be all these winds of doctrine that will be blown into the church and will carry away many people. People who are not grounded. And so we just had a, a great sermon looking at the importance of Jesus Christ being div divine, completely divine as well. So not, not being creator or anything. Anything less than that means that he cannot be our savior. That's, that's a simple, if I was to summarize it down, Anything less than Jesus being fully God, holy God, okay, and fully man, holy God means that he's, he, he's not in a position to save us. And, they, and I don't think they followed it all through. And so Jay was just breaking it down for us and giving us example after example of why it's important for Jesus to be fully divine, completely divine. But there are people, and then he showed us some videos at the end, a video at the end of uh, two, pre two preachers who have had um, training at some of our independent ministries, um, Amazing Facts and Secrets and Sealed, and they are preaching that, Jesus, that that's um, idol worship, saying that Jesus Christ is God, is idol worship. So, sorry. Okay. Maria, Sister Maria. Yes, I just would like to... Um, uh, Give us humble thought in this. Uh, this is why it's important to be, be, be diligent study from Bible and the spirit of prophecy. And the spirit of prophecy is not just what Ellen G. White wrote it. It's since uh, Genesis to Revelation and, uh, and what also what sister wrote it because if we if we don't do we will be deceived yes just, just one quotation was sharing with brother our brother who preached says uh, you remember all of us we remember that god uh, one of the disciples told to ask jesus says oh hey show us show us the father hmm. what what uh, jesus answer have you been, have Philip? Have you been? You know, he said, uh, "I've been a long time with you, and you're telling me show us the Father. If you see me, you see the Father. Perfect answer for everything." Sure, that's right. You know, one of the things about the divinity of Christ and how white people get mixed up is because 
Jesus, they forget this whole incarnation where God gave up divinity, took on humanity. And in that transition, there's, there was, um, and then when he goes back to heaven, he, he, he is fully human. He is fully human. Okay. Yeah. And so it, it's, so they're trying to, it's, it's in that transition that they get things confused. I personally think it's, they get it confused that this divine being became human. Okay. Incarnation. And then went back to heaven as a human, still bearing the scars on his hands and on his side. So I think that's one of the areas in which they get confused. Okay. I think whoever is here and has never experienced this kind of a news, let it be a wake-up call to each and every one of us to drive us more to the Bible, to more study, and to draw, drive us closer to Jesus. Mm. He's the only hope we have. But I tell you what, it's, 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 it's a wake-up call for me to, to be able to experience this and to, to hear it firsthand of what's going on. Because it could happen to either one of us. we got to make sure it doesn't. You're talking about the demon possession? Yes. Yeah. Well, I mean, not that, it, not that we're in danger of being demon possessed, but that it, 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 we, we can infront it at any time, and we have to know what to do. And we have to, we're not going to be able to do this with our strength. Yeah. Only strength is in Jesus. Now, during the great time of trouble, we are, we are completely separated from the world. Okay? That, so we, we're not running it into demon possessed people. During the little time of trouble, when we are given the loud cry, we are going into these cities. In the cities are demon possessed people. Okay, so you'll be walking down the street, and there'll be de literally demon possessed people, people who have made their decision, made the decision against God, and they have been totally taken over by demons. Some of us will go to court. The Bible says that we'll end up in court, and we will meet other Adventists there in court who are completely demon possessed. Yeah, so. Because they've rejected the Holy Spirit, they've rejected, they made their final decision, the Holy Spirit is fully withdrawn from them, the demons are fully possessed, and we'll meet judges and police officers and other sort of people who are fully demon possessed. So, what this man is experiencing, okay, we will see it manifested in front of our eyes multiple times. And we, we have to we have to go in faith that. Angels are protecting us. Please remember when it's when they when somebody rejects God during that time, the angels are withdrawn from them. The angels don't go back to heaven. The angels are reassigned. Okay, so instead of having one or two angels around us, we have a whole myriad, of, <laughs> a group of angels around us—20, 30, 40, 50 angels around us. And with that sort of presence of angels, we can go into the cities, into these dangerous places, and pull out souls that are perishing. Otherwise, we wouldn't be able to go. We wouldn't be able to go. Not without knowing that there's a, you know, hundreds of angels around us protecting us from these demons. It would be foolhardy to go. It would be foolhardy to go. Okay? Okay, Sister Tish, and then we'll come Well, up. I was just going to make a remark that <clears throat> this may sound a little bit simplistic, but we just kind of have to cling to what we know as God and his strength. Mm -hmm. I'm with God. God's with me. Mm -hmm. One of the things that I notice, <clears throat> especially in the sermon this morning, and I've noticed it with other people, Tim Jennings is one. There's another guy up in Georgia that everybody thinks is so great. A few problems with him. But they get their brain going so much and they get outside the box mm -hmm. and they start making all these arguments about why this isn't so or why that isn't so or why Mrs. White isn't so or, or whatever. And it, it creates confusion in your mind. 
Mm. And at some point, you kind of have to draw yourself back into what you know and your relationship with God. Mm. And like I said, it may sound a little bit simplistic, but they're making it so hard because they're so convincing. Mm. The Satan is a very convincing entity. And it's easy to be convinced away from your belief system if you're not strong in your relationship with God. Yeah, and that's we we have to be grounded. Right? We we have to be and th and th yeah, and this is this is a time of study. We must be used in this time while there's peace, while there's access to all this information to be solidly grounded on the truth because these winds of doctrine are going to be very subtle, very subtle. Remember, you know, it wasn't a big lie that satan brought to eve it wasn't a big lie that satan brought to jesus just just a little if you are listen yeah and we have to be we have to be attuned to the small things go ahead yes it's really true we have to know our bibles that's where our safety lies mm -hmm. and the spirit of prophecy um we we need to have it solid in our hearts so when people come with the counterfeit, the way that the um, the government finds counterfeit bills, they don't study the counterfeits. They study the real thing so that anything out of the ordinary they recognize. Mm -hmm. But what I was going to say is that there is a whole generation coming up of kids that have been indoctrinated mm. by Satan. Mm -hmm. And we as parents and grandparents unknowingly have been enablers. Mm. We bought the little kids Disney stuff. Mm. You know, we let them watch movies. We did this. I'm speaking, you know, generally. We didn't know. We didn't know it was bad. But we've allowed these kids to have that their whole lives. Mm. This family we're talking about, neither one of the parents raised their children in the Lord. But those kids have seen every Disney movie. They know about all of it. And they played video games all their whole lives. They never grew up learning about Jesus. Mm -hmm. And I, I know that there's a whole generation of these kids mm -hmm. coming up. And they are going to be running the world sure. soon. And then on top you know? of that. Yeah. Yeah. And so we have a responsibility to help those in our immediate circle by not feeding them any of this stuff anymore. Mm -hmm. No matter how cute it looks and no matter how much they love it, little Pokemon toys, mm -hmm. we can't do it. We just, and it's hard, mm -hmm. you know, it's hard at Christmas time. What do you give them, you know? But we got to, we got to do it because we can't enable this next generation. Yeah, and we have to sound the alarm too as loud as we can. Yeah. You know, that this stuff's dangerous. Tell the truth, no, tell the truth. Yeah. The truth that we know. Yeah. And I think the important thing is that we are all to live a completely different life. There's a the, there's the life of this world and the, the life God has called us to do. And they're poles apart. They literally are poles apart. And if we are, you know, if there's not much difference, it's because we're living too close to the world. We, we need to, you know, they're diametrically opposite to each other. And so, yes, there's this life in the world, but there's the life that God has asked us to live. And if, if we had raised the children in that life, they would at least have a, a knowledge and a foundation. And on top of that, you know, if if Bill Gates is to be believed, the vaccination that they're now giving kids is attacking their God gene, making their brain 
and able to comprehend spiritual things or, or have an affinity for spiritual matters if, if, if Bill Gates is to be believed. Okay. Demons can't just take over a person. I don't, I don't know their story, but in general, okay, rule is that there has to be some sort of door for the demon to have, gain access to a person. And usually it's something that they believe or something that they're doing, that is, which is a demonstration of their belief, that gives them gives the demon access. The demon so can, can come in and take up control of the person's mind. Remember the battle is for the mind? And so it's, what is the mind accepting, believing? If it, is it some tarot cards? Is it a belief in um, the occult or, or a fascination with witches or there's something and you and the key is you know you're not just casting out the demon because Jesus says if you cast it out you know he's gonna wander around and come back to an empty house you have to you have to cast out the demon you also have to fill the person and also you have to um, um, close the door close the door so part of what Jay was doing was Asking the family, what, what's, what's evil in your house? What is the thing? And going out and burning it and destroying it. There has to be. Otherwise, if, if the, the devil will come and take over all of us. <laughs> yeah. Where's Joel when you need him? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. I just. Yeah, just repeating, just for everyone who missed it, okay? Yeah, the, the movies today are just bathed, soaked, saturated with spiritualism, with the occult. And if it, even if it's not that, there's other factors, things, you know, the LGBTQ lifestyle, this, this whole concept that money is a solution, let's make it big in this world. There's so many concepts in movies, or every single movie, that is trying to train us along the lines of this world. Even Christian movies, okay, have many of these concepts in, so we have to be very careful, okay? I just wanted to let you know that I have received word that your prayers, our prayers were heard, and that there is calm, and that he, I spoke with him briefly, and there is, there is quiet now. Pastor is on his way over there, and, um, Maybe we, if it would be okay, just to have a short word of prayer, of thanksgiving. Definitely. Okay. Right All right. Let's just let's just thank Jesus, Lord. You are King of Kings and Lord of Lords, and we just we come and we run and we hide in the shadow of the great rock in a weary land, Lord. There's no place else to hide, and we thank you, Lord, that you are our hiding place, and we thank you for your help in this time of trouble, Lord. In Jesus' name, Amen. Amen. Just understand, just, 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 let's not pass by that. Let's just underline that, highlight it. Your prayers, your collective prayers, had an immediate impact in a situation miles away. Okay, just, just remember that. Your collective prayers, you running to the throne of God, pleading with the Father, had an immediate impact on somebody you've never met. Okay, miles away. Okay, so let so just just remember that, underline it, underline that score, put that up in your memory to say recall at a later date. Okay, when you get discouraged, recall it. When, when somebody say pray for me, just yeah, my prayers are effective. My prayers are effective. Okay, even though when you knelt down, you may have felt and you did feel uh, unworthy to ask God for anything. You felt wretched, but God answered your prayers. Okay. Um, I just would like to add in in what we are praying for, and also um, remnant people. God's remnant people has to be very um, meticulous in this time as we approach the coming of Jesus. It's not just, uh, I, beside that, what this brother Alex is experimenting, we know that uh, um, we are also, our brother uh, 
J. J. She is about uh, all of the movies, everything. But guess what? One of the other tool that enemy is using is the food. Also, in the food, the enemy is is getting there profoundly because uh, the most of the processed food has uh, nanoparticles. Now, or maybe I could say. No processed food is safe of that. They have nanoparticles that change our behavior. This is why God asks us to, to go back to the more simple way to eat. Uh, this is uh, again and again uh, a glory encourages us to do that. Uh, if by God's grace and mercy, this advice we could take in consideration. Our lifestyle will be changed. Our connection with God will change. Okay. I'd like you to grab your Bibles and turn to Revelation. Was there another comment? No. Revelation chapter 3. Once again, raise your hands when you have a question. Revelation chapter 3, verse 7. And to the angel of the church of Philadelphia write, These things saith he that is holy, he that is true, he that is at the key of David, he that openeth, and no man shutteth, and shutteth, and no man openeth. Remember we, were going, we started going through this, started breaking it down? This, I'm not, we, we did go through this. Okay, so Philadelphia, we're almost to the end. Um, shortest time period, AD 44 to 1833, just, just 11 years, just 11 years period. Do, 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 you remember, do you remember going through some of this? Okay, I feel like we have to go through all of it again. Okay. Okay. Okay, let's 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 look at this. This is a message to um, Revelate um, Philadelphia. Let's read it all. And to the angel of the church in Philadelphia, write these things: saith he that is holy, he that is true, he that hath the key of David, he that openeth and no man shutteth, and shutteth and no man openeth. I know thy works. Behold, I have set before thee an open door, and no man can shut it. For thou hast a little strength, and hast kept my word and has not denied my name. Behold, I will make them of the synagogue of Satan, which say they are Jews and are not, but do lie. Behold, I will make them to come and worship before thy feet, and to know that, that I have loved thee, because thou hast kept the word of my patience. I also will keep thee from the hour of temptation, which shall come upon all the world to try them that dwell upon the earth. Behold, I come quickly. Hold that fast which thou hast, that no man take thy crown. Verse 12. Him that overcometh will I make a pillar in the temple of my God, and he shall go no more out, and I will write upon him the name of my God and the name of the city of my God which is New Jerusalem, which cometh down out of heaven from my God. And I will write upon him my new name. And the final verse, 13, He that have an ear to hear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. So that's the message to Lady Seer. So you, as always, we're going to break it down. What did I say? Did I say latest here? I'm glad you're listening. Okay. Just okay, I just want to let you pay in it. Okay. So no, we're gonna approach this one slightly differently, okay? We're gonna look at the background of what is happening at this time period. So we're just gonna jump straight into the time period and say what is happening. So this is the background to what is happening. So Philadelphia was the youngest of the seven cities. It was situated on the high volcanic plateau, making it strong. 
uh, it a strong fortress city. It was founded by the Pergamean king Athelias II, whose love for his brother Immunenes the second gave him the epithet Philadelphia. It was after him that Philadelphia, brotherly love, was named. So Philadelphia basically means brotherly love or city of brotherly love. Okay, so we 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 should expect to see this sort of concept in this time period. So the historical context, the historical context of what's going on, 1833 to 1844. What happens in 1844? Great disappointment. What happens in 1833? Miller starts preaching around 1833. So this is a period of the Great Awakening. Okay. So when this period of the Great Awakening, what were they expecting? Jesus Christ to come. Okay. So so let's let's see. We, we we're gonna see this. Okay. So 1843, uh, 44. This 18, 1843 is the first date that they gave for this. Um, Second coming of Jesus Christ. So first, then they moved to the spring of 1844. Then they actually moved it to October 22nd, 1844. Okay. So, but this. Joel, Joel, where's the microphone, please? Please. Sorry. During this period of time, my great grandmother. Elsie Stevens was born in Rochester, New York, mm. um, and she was an adult, well, not an adult, but a teenager by this time. Mm. The disappointment was so great, they wouldn't talk about it. Yeah. They wouldn't talk about it. When I was a child, like, she died the year I was born in 1950, um, which was kind of interesting because she was in her hundreds and I asked my mother years later how come didn't I ever know this story and she said they wouldn't talk about it they were the disappointment was so disappointing yeah that even after they began to see the error of the whole thing that they wouldn't speak of it and so if we if we actually knit that into our story a little bit here, you can kind of see that when Mrs. White kind of came and started writing about things, they had a hard time with her mm -hmm. because they basically just wanted this whole thing to kind of go away. A very bad memory, very bad yeah. experience, 1843. Okay, so this is Millerism. This is Paul from Wikipedia. The Millerites were the followers of the teachings of William Miller, who in 1831, virtually a beginning, first shared publicly his belief that the second advent of Jesus Christ would occur in roughly the year 1843-1844. Coming during the Second Great Awakening, his teachings were spread widely and grew in popularity, which led to the event known as the Great Disappointment. Okay? So William Miller, we don't need to go more about it. The Millerites originally had adherents across denominational lines, okay? So we have especially from Baptist, Presbyterian, Methodist, and Campbellite churches. So this is where this idea of brotherly love comes in. So you have all these people, was, they weren't, they, they were still Baptists, but believed in the second coming. They were still Methodists, but believed in the second coming. And then it was only afterwards where they really forced out of their churches this fellowship basically as communicated, and then they became Millerites, uh, some of which became sent the Adventists. Okay, um, so Campbellite churches forming distinct denominations only after the Great Disappointment, they were united by a belief in the imminent return of Jesus Christ, the Second Advent. Who are the Campbellites? I don't know. Okay, I don't know who the Campbellites are. So, Philadelphia, from the Bible commentary, when the historical application is made, the message to Philadelphia may be thought of as appropriate to the various movements within Protestantism during the latter years of the 18th century and the first part of the 19th, whose objective it was to make religion a vital personal affair. 
In a special way, the great evangelical and other movements in Europe and the United States restored the spirit of brotherly love and stressed practical godliness in contrast with the forms of religion, revived faith in the saving grace of Christ and in the um, nearness of his return resulted in a deeper spirit of Christian fellowship than the church had experienced since the early days of the Reformation. Okay? So, in this period of time, the people really started fellowshipping together. And I think we see this here. You know, we, we, some of us from Avon Park and some of us from other churches. We've got Hispanics here. We have Blacks here. We have some Filipinos. We just thought, regardless of those previous classes or groups, we come together because we have a belief in the imminent return of Jesus Christ. Now, please remember, the disappointment sifted them. The, dis the great disappointment sifted the Millerites. Okay? And it shook out all those who were, who were in it but maybe not seriously or wholeheartedly. And there was only a, a, a core, a small core group who hung on and said, who knew that this experience was real and genuine and re they really held on to it. Okay. In this prophetic description of the seven churches, we see the fall of the Sardis church is immediately followed by the Philadelphia or, as the words are signified, brotherly love church such indeed were the fifty thousand believers who by the second angel's message were brought out from all the varied churches and united in one bond of brotherly love on the great cardinal truth of the imminent advent of christ and this is going to be repeated again this this pulling out from all over the place and you're going to have one group of people who who's primary focus isn't isn't um uh, any break of doctrine but the imminent return of jesus christ paula you wanted to say still? um yes we're all going to focus on the second coming of jesus christ popular. no the truth is never popular the, the wicked and satan don't make the truth popular. They're going to oppose it at every opportunity and make life hard for the for those people who want to pursue it. Okay, like you know, Mrs. White talks about um, degrees of persecution, and one of the degrees of persecution is that people will be promised incentives. Incentives. So, for example, we want you to f fulfill this church office. Only you can do it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So that people are drawn away into the old church. Yeah? So we have to be very, very careful. Paula? Just looking at the end of the sentence there at the bottom, the imminent advent of Christ, isn't this the word that was changed, which is causing incredible controversy, mm. the word imminent? And so if the word imminent was a shaking issue then could it then you know repeat history repeat and it become a, a shaking issue now because those who believe in the imminent return of jesus christ are listening to present truth and preparing mm. and and having all these reforms and those who don't believe it's that imminent are pursuing not necessarily bad worldly things but worldly things education career relationships so there's a two, there's two classes of people just around that word imminent. Okay. So you so for those of you who don't know, the, um, Pastor David Gates preached a, a sermon, a couple of sermons about this, where he talked about how um, in GC 2015 they changed the focus from Im imminent to soon, imminent to soon, and um, because they said it was a translation issue. Okay. I looked up the Campbellites. <laughs> this is quite the, this is quite a story. Mm. The Campbellites actually um, branched off and started what they call restore restorationist Christianity, which was started by Joseph Smith. Oh. Mm. So the Campbellites ended up because being the Mormons. Oh yeah. 
okay? Back in my hometown of Aurora, Illinois, there's a church that also has a college. It's called the Advent Christian College, Advent Christian Church. And I had heard something about it, so I visited their library, and they have a Miller or Millerite room in that library, and they have some of the artifacts from William Miller. Uh, they had a trunk there, an old trunk, and oh, they had a pad. I think he was a constable or something, and a pad where he wrote out fines or whatever. And uh, I thought that was interesting. They were part of the group that was disappointed and didn't go any further and formed their own little mm. uh, Sunday-keeping group, Advent yeah. Christian. Amen. Okay. So here we are back at the back at the sermon this morning. That's what it said here. Did you hear me? Yeah, the the Campbellites ended up not believing. The Mormons don't believe in the Trinity. Yeah. So here we've taken one group of people in this, and you can kind of see how this disappointment became so disappointing that people just splintered off into all kinds of mindsets to the point where the Trinity doesn't exist anymore, and now we're and then Joseph Smith went off with his people, and look where we are now. Mm. Mm. Seems fair. Okay. Now it says, so on to Angel Church of Philadelphia, we worked out some background information on Philadelphia. You know that 1833, 1844, we know what was happening during that period. We know about its historical context. It says this in this verse. He that is true, he that is he that have the key of David, he that openeth and no man shutteth, and shutteth and no man openeth. Let me ask you a question. Who is this referring to in bold? Jesus. Jesus is referring to Jesus. Okay. Now, what's interesting about this description of Jesus is this: is that it does not come from Revelation chapter one. In all the other churches, how Jesus describes in, how Jesus is described in Revelation chapter one is parts of it are used for the other six churches, but not for Philadelphia. Philadelphia is unique. They pull other descriptions of Jesus from other places, so there must be significance why they did that. Okay. It must be significant. So this is the description of Jesus, okay, in Revelation chapter 1. And I turned to see the voice that spoke with me, and I am being turned, I saw seven golden candlesticks. And in the midst of the seven candlesticks, one like the Son of Man, Jesus, clothed with a white garment down to the foot, girt about the paps with a golden girdle. His head and his hair were white like wool, as white as snow, and his eyes were as a flame of fire and his feet like unto fine breasts and as if they burned in a furnace and his voice as a sound of many waters and he had in his right hand seven stars and out of his mouth went a sharp two-edged sword and his countenance was as a sun shining in his strength so this is the description of J jesus in Revelation chapter 1, we see in all the previous churches, we also see in Laodicea, but not in Philadelphia. So remember, we were saying Jesus is the solution. How Jesus describes himself is a solution for what the churches need at that time. Okay, so whether it's just walking in the candlesticks or holding the seven stars or him with a two-edged sword or his eyes, whatever, however Jesus describes himself at the beginning of the letter, of that letter, is how that was what the church needs Jesus to be. But in Philadelphia, we don't need any. They didn't need any of this. They needed something else from Jesus, and so they, so we get this other stuff. Okay. So the a new description of Jesus, um, and so we're going to look at it <coughs> phrase by phrase. He that is holy. 
this this title is equivalent to the the holy one used of God in the Old Testament. In the New Testament, a similar ascription is applied repeatedly to Christ, implying his deity. I, I'm going to ignore the Old Testament ones. We'll just jump into the New Testament ones. Okay, can somebody read Luke 135 for us, please? As somebody who's got the microphone in their hand. And the angel answered and said unto her, The Holy Ghost shall come upon thee, and the power of the highest shall overshadow thee. Thereof also the holy things which shall be born of thee shall be called the Son of God. So, the angel, what's the name of the angel? You don't know many angels' names. Okay. Yeah. Gabriel, okay? Angel, the angel is Gabriel. Who is Gabriel visiting in Luke chapter 1? Mary. So the angel is visiting Mary in Luke chapter 1. And Mary's and she and angels just told me, hey, listen, you can be pregnant. And she's going, um, how? Okay. And then she, Gabriel gives this description. And it ends it by saying, that holy thing which shall be born of thee shall be called the Son of God. So it's this, so here's this, the use of the word holy. This whole this pregnancy, the child that you have is holy, is going to be divine. So the angel is telling Mary, you're going to give birth to a divine being, the holy thing, born of God. Okay? Another reference, Acts chapter 4. Do you want to pass the mic to somebody? Aaron, well, she, you've been volunteered. Acts 4.27, and we'll skip a few verses and read verse 30. It's 2730. For, for of a truth against the holy child Jesus, whom thou hast anointed, both Herod and Pontius Pilate, with the Gentiles, and the people of Israel were gathered together. By stretching forth thine hand to heal, that signs and wonders may be done by the name of the, thy holy child Jesus. Okay. So once again, Jesus linked to this whole concept of him being holy, divine, because only God is holy. Only God is holy. So describing Jesus as being holy, you're automatically saying that Jesus is divine because only God is holy. Okay? Okay, so, so that's the holy part. So Philadelphia needs this aspect of God where he's holy. Now, he that is true. Okay. Um, he that is true. That's from the Greek. Can anybody say this? Anybody in the Greek? Okay, thank you. Which means genuine, real, in contrast with false gods. So Jesus is going to be genuine. He's going to be real. Now, when I looked it up at that word in the blue letter Bible, this is the meaning. And I love this first bold bit. Okay, who's got the microphone now? Sister Pat. Which has not only the name and resemblance, but the real nature corresponding to the name in every respect corresponding to the idea signified by the name, real, true, genuine. Okay, so they put holy first, which means divine. Then they follow it up by saying he is true, which means he's not just resembling divinity he's a genuine article he's the real thing okay that's what it's saying every in every respect corresponding to the idea signify so in every respect of holiness jesus is the genuine the it, we have this phrase in england called the real mccoy he's the real mccoy he's definitely completely totally it okay then it says, he that had the key of David. Now, any reference to David, who's been dead a couple of thousand years, is messianic, correct? Okay, now the key of David. Now, this refers to a particular story. Um, the key of David. A key is a symbol of power, correct? If you walk around with a bunch of keys, I, I go to the jail, and all the officers have these keys that's chained to their waist. And... They use these keys to open the gates, to open the doors and let you in and out and so forth, okay? 
So it's a symbol of power. And wouldn't the um, wouldn't the inmates like to get hold of those keys? Okay, a key is a symbol of power. The Son of God is the rightful heir to David's throne, and he's about to take to himself his great power and to reign. Hence, he is represented as having the key of David. The throne of David or of Christ on which he is to reign is included in the capital of his kingdom, the new Jerusalem, now above, but which is to be located on this earth where he is to reign forever and ever. Okay. Now let's look at what it says in Luke chapter 1 once again. He shall be great and shall be called the Son of the Highest. And the Lord God shall give unto him the throne of his father David. And he shall reign over the house of Jacob forever. And of his kingdom there shall be no end. Okay. Once again, the nativity story, once again, Gabriel, okay, talking about describing Jesus. Okay. And he's going to reign on his father's throne, David. David is his his father okay now it gets deeper um sister Jeannie, can you read you see it this verse applies isaiah's prophecy concerning elia eliakim to christ isaiah 22 20 through 22 see second kings 18 18 eliakim was appointed to have supervision over the household of david as signified by the fact that he was to be given the key of the house of David. Christ's possession of the key represents his jurisdiction over the church and over the divine purpose to be achieved through it. Okay. Now, now listen carefully. This is talking about something that literally happened, but it's in Isaiah. Did, did Isaiah write before, at the time of, or after King David? After King David. A long, hundreds of years after King David. Okay? So this Eliakim and this King David, Eliakim wasn't around with David, but there's this whole prophetic thing about this person, okay, who's going to have control over the kingdom of David. Let's read Isaiah 22, verses 20. To 22. What about Miss Mary? Does she want to read? And it shall come to pass in that day that I will call my servant Eliakim, the son of Hilkiah. Yeah. And I will clothe him with thy robe and strengthen him with thy girdle. And I will commit thy government into his hand. And he shall be a father to the inhabitants of Jerusalem and to the house of Judah. And the key of the house of David will I lay upon his shoulder, so he shall open and none shall shut. And he shall shut and none shall open. This last verse rings so true with what we've just read in Revelation chapter 3 about Philadelphia, how he will he will open and no man shut and shut and no man open. So there's a whole heap of um, coming together of between this passage and what we've just read in Revelation. So the prophecy outlined here is being fulfilled in Revelation, which applies to our time. Okay. Um, who's got the microphone? Go ahead, Joel. The immediate background for this imagery is Isaiah 22, verses 20 to 22, where the key is to the key to David's storehouse. In the message to the church in Philadelphia, Jesus is the one who has received full authority and has access to the heavenly saint storehouse. In the New Testament, Christ is given all authority, Matthew 28, 18. He is appointed as head over all things to the church, Ephesians 1, 22. So, remember... The description of Jesus is what the church needs. So the church needs access to the heavenly storehouse. Okay, The church needs the wealth and the abundance and the riches and the blessing that only God can provide in this heavenly storehouse. And David, Jesus, has that key. So if they have Jesus, they have access to all of this power and resources that 
they need. Okay, last and last, he that openeth and no man shutteth, and shutteth and no man openeth. Remember, we read some virtually similar in Isaiah 22 22. Okay, so let's look at this opening and shutting and shutting and opening. Joel, don't screw up the microphone. He that openeth, that is, with the key of David, Christ has full authority to open and to shut, to carry the plan of redemption forward to success. From the Bible commentary, Mrs. White says this, Jesus has risen up and shut the door of the... Okay, so where was Jesus in 18, 1833? Oh, where did he move in 1844? So Jesus is a very neat and tidy person. Even when he was resurrected, he, he folded up his bed clothes, um, his, his gown, and left, left left it neatly at the foot of his bed. Okay, very neat. So if he leaves one room, you think he's going to leave the door open? He's going to shut the door behind him. Okay, and but he's also opened another door, and this door is into the, and that's where Jesus Christ is now. That's what Jesus Christ is now. This, what we see in 1833, 1844, this Church of Philadelphia, is this movement, this movement of Christ from the holy place to the most holy place. Now, we're gonna, I'm going to point this out later on, but I'll, I'll say it now. Ranko Stefanovic does not emphasize this at all. And please remember, Ranko Stefanovic's book is the key book that students at Andrews or in seminary use as their reference. Ranko Stefanovic, The Revelation of Jesus Christ. There you go. You'll see this image. When you see this image, you know it's from his book. Okay? But he will not focus in on this movement from Christ into, from the holy place into the most holy place. You may ask why? Because it's a downplay in on our doctrine of the sanctuary. But Mrs. White told us that will be the case in the last days. Okay, so this all uh, sorry about this. This all is to do is 1844. Okay, the whole movement. Okay, Brother Phil is too far. Tom, can you read it? I'll try. The true witness declares, Behold, I have set before you an open door. Let us thank God with heart and soul and voice, and let us learn to approach unto him as through an open door, believing that we may come freely with our petitions and that he will hear and answer it is by living faith in his power to help that we shall receive strength to fight the battle of the lord uh, with the con confidence assurance of victory thank you okay so we we now have access to the most holy place. And we this Sabbath school lesson, we were talking about the most holy place and the Ark of the Covenant. And above there we have the we have the law of God in the Ark of the Covenant. Okay. When the law condemns us as sinners. And then above the Ark of the Covenant, we have the mercy seat. And we can we have free access now to approach this mercy seat and ask for forgiveness okay this access is time limited because when he leaves he's going to shut the door behind him and he that is filthy let him be filthy still he that is holy let him be holy still okay and that will be at the end of probation now is our time to make things right to seek god now is the time while we have access okay let's move on to the next verse i think we understand verse seven okay fred 
I'm going to ask you to read uh, this next verse first. Just remind us of the verse, and then we're going to focus in. I know thy works. I know thy works. I know thy works. Behold, I have set before thee an open door, and no man can shut shut it. For thou hast a little strength, and hast kept my word, and hast not denied my name. Mm, okay. Now, this phrase, I know thy works, is not unique to the church of Philadelphia. In fact, God says it for every single church. I know what's going on. I, not, not only on the outside, but also what's on the inside, what's in your heart and mind. I know what's going on. And the interesting thing about this is that there's no reproof in Philadelphia. He's not saying, oh, man, you're tolerating the Nicolaitans or you've lost your first love or anything. No, there's no reproof. He says, you guys are pretty good. <laughs> you're pretty good. There's room for improvement, but you, you guys are pretty good. I'm not, I'm not telling you off at all, okay? So <clears throat> what was interesting, though, the reason why they would get into this position is because of the great disappointment. Because what the great disappointment did was, you know, during Miller's time, everybody's, yes, Jesus Christ has come in, okay? And lots of people got excited and, and they were doing stuff. And people thought, oh, my, Jesus Christ is coming. What am I going to do? Let me, just, let me just go along with it. And lots of people went along with it, along with it, okay? But the disappointment separated the fake from the genuine. The disappointment. The challenge to their faith separated the fake from the genuine. The same is happening today. The same is happening today. There's, do, there's lots of people say the events, events. Yes, we're sent the events. We believe in the second coming of Jesus Christ. Yes, 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 yes. But but we are being separated, the fake from the genuine. Please remember the Mrs. White's vision of the narrow path. And at every stage, when when they had to give up something. They have to give up the wagons and get on horses, then give up the horses and just carry on pack, pack then give up the pack. At every st stage, some people dropped away down into the abyss below, down to the world below. Okay, Marie, you wanted to say something? Uh, Kimmy, my mind, that uh, you know they were expecting the second coming of Jesus mm -hmm. and uh, when happened a um, uh, great disappointment uh, for us it could be a, um, a example that uh, uh, the people who uh, what um, is is if is is for us example as a shaking, mm -hmm. no? Because uh, this is uh, I see in my in my uh, short journey as Adventist, uh, I see that um, we are excited when we read, but we don't apply in the life that God gave us, mm -hmm. and we got disappointment because uh, genuine people of God. Uh, um, are willing to do what God said, mm -hmm. and and we have to put our our willingness to do that, and it's a blessing. And I believe for that reason also, um, God give us trials and tribulation to 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 let us let us have more confidence in his word and what God said. And uh, when his word came reality to us, um, we are more more genuine what God said. More, we are more willing to, to do what he said. And also I wanted to, uh, to share maybe like, um, maybe that great disappointment also is still in us uh, as a drama when we read because when is the time that god is telling us go to the go to the country and do uh, and because this will happen 
how many of us we still in we still in the city because we said do, do you think jesus is coming mm -hmm. no yeah yeah so you're, you're absolutely right we are going through a very similar experience i i imagine that you know that the people who went along with the middle right message because their friends were there their family were there and they they just went along and i see that there's many adventists who go to church just because their friends and family are there they go for the social rather than for the genuine experience of getting ready for jesus christ church is not a social club it's not a social club church is a hospital for sick people to help fix people but it's also a place where people learn and grow and in this case be fed present truth okay so this is all about the great disappointment the great and that was that was the shaking and sifting that they experienced at that time we are going to experience the same in our days as well revelation 3 8, behold i have set before thee an open door in the preceding verse christ is said to have the key of david verse 8 may imply that with the key he now opens before the philadelphia church a door of unlimited opportunity for personal victory in the struggle with sin and for bearing witness to the saving truth of the gospel so at the end of this period the church is set up in such a position where even though it's a small church it's a very powerful church spiritually and so they have this great opportunity to do incredible things if they can just hold on to the truth okay a door of opportunity Paul had some doors of opportunity open for him, didn't he? Yeah? He did. He said this. Um, who's, who's got the microphone? Who's, who's turned it to read? Brother Fred. Did you did read the last one? No, no I don't remember the last one. Okay. Oh. Steve, Steve, he's got <laughs> issues with his eyes. <laughs> Maria. And when they were come and had gathered the church together, they rehearsed all that God had done with them and how he had opened the door of faith unto the Gentiles. So this door of opportunity can be seen as a door of opportunity to win people, okay? Which will be the same at the end of the shaking of the Seventh-day Adventist church. Because at the end of the shaking of Seventh-day Adventist church, we receive the Holy Spirit, the latter rain, and we go out with a loud cry. And many people who we've lost, um, the empty pews will be filled. Um, 1 Corinthians 16, verse 9, For a great door and effectual is open unto me, and the, there are many adversaries. Okay, sorry. Adversaries adversaries I'm trying to speak american now adversaries <laughs> okay okay so and uh, there are many which is once again also true for our experience we have this great door of opportunity with the power with the holy spirit we're going now but there's going to be the whole world against us okay great opportunities but great opponents as well so and you can read it some more opportunities in there or there when god opens the door no one is able to stop christian christians in their service for god no one except for the christian themselves we are the ones who are obstacles this is why it says uh, our greatest uh, we have more to fear from within than from without or the greatest obstacle for progress is from within the church and from without the church okay so the final atonement and the investigative judgment so all this is part of this period of time this investigative judgment do you know what the investigative judgment is i seem to speaking in tongues <laughs> anybody else got a clear answer what's the investigative judgment We're in the period of investigative judgment. What is so? Who? God is looking through our cases. 
God is, God is deciding who is going to be saved and who is not going to be saved. Correct? Okay? And this, and, and this investigation is, just, is not just looking at the books. It's giving people a test. Okay? And this test will prove whether they are ready or not. What is that test? The Sunday law. And how do you prepare for your test? You prepare for your test by passing the prior tests. Okay? Beforehand. Sister Maria. Just another um, uh, warning, I could say, like a brother did just tell us, just to be aware that um, through the media, that this 3BM, for example, they are teaching the Sunday law is nothing to do with the coming of Jesus. Yeah. I just let you know that. Yes. In 3ABM in the Sabbath school. Wow. Wow. Uh, okay, so let's make sure we hear it for ourselves before we repeat it. Okay? So, okay, we'll we check it out. Okay. The three AB and Sabbath schools on YouTube, so you can watch it. So the final investigative judgment. This is this this is a period of we're in now. This is part of this is part of the sanctuary message, correct? And this is this is central to Adventism. Please remember what I said before. Ranko Stevanovich does not mention this at all in his book. He does not mention this. This is the time period in which the church is in. This is crucial. This shapes this whole time period. This doctrine it shapes it, and he just bypasses it all completely, completely. Um, Mr. White says this in the book Christ in his sanctuary in the future deceptions of every kind is to arise okay and we want solid ground for our feet we want solid pillars for the building not one pin is to remove from that which has which the lord has established okay so first of all before you read any further okay what we what has been established is solid and nothing is going to be removed. To bring in something doesn't mean you have to remove any of the pillars or change the foundation. What we've got established is absolutely solid. Amen? Okay. Then she goes on to say, the enemy will bring in false theories, such as the doctrine that there is no sanctuary. Okay, there is one. This is one of the points on which there will be a departing from the faith. So, Mrs. White years ago said, within Adventism, false theories are going to come. One such false theory is that there's going to be some people who can bring in the false doctrine that there is no sanctuary. And I'm telling you, Ryan Costa Vanish Fish, probably if I sat down with him and questioned him, I'm pretty sure. Okay, because I haven't had this conversation, I'm pretty sure he would indicate that he does not believe that there is a sanctuary. Okay, now this is not new to Adventism. It started a little while. You may remember your friend, Mr. Pastor Ford. Yeah. Desmond Ford, okay. An Australian theologian who studied what? What did he study? Evangelicalism. What? So if you study evangelicals, by, by beholding, you become changed. So if you spend years and years and years studying evangelicalism, isn't it possible that you will take on some of their thinking? Yeah. And do evangelicals believe in the sanctuary? Let me help you. No other Christian denomination believes in the sanctuary. It is only us. It's only us. So if you're studying any other Christian denomination and this is your key, then you're going to end up not believing in the sanctuary. Okay? By beholding, you will become changed. So let's get a bit about Desmond Ford. He says this, Within the Seventh-day Adventist church, he was a controversial figure. He was dismissed from ministry in the Adventist church in 1980, following his critique of the church's 
investigative judgment. That's what we're talking about. He had since worked through the non-denominational evangelical ministry, Good News Unlimited, for disagreed with some aspects of traditional Adventist end time beliefs. Because if you get rid of the investigative judgment, it throws all the end in the air. Just... However, he still defended a conservative view of scripture, the Seventh day Adventist Sabbath and a vegetarian lifestyle. He viewed the writings of Ellen G. White as useful devotionally. Okay? Because if you believed in Mrs. White, you would have to believe in the sanctuary. If you if you want to not believe in the sanctuary, you have to downplay Mrs. White. Okay? Go ahead. Sister Jeannie, the microphone is on its way to you as swiftly as Joel's feet can take. If you believe in the Bible, you have to believe in the sanctuary. Can you get around it? Sure. Um, yeah, people do. They, they have ways of bending and avoiding and not reading and, and, and pulling words out and, and using modern translations and to avoid the sanctuary. Yeah, they get around it. But definitely with Mrs. White, it's, it's plain as day, you know, the, this whole concept of the sanctuary. So if you're going to get rid of the sanctuary, you want to get rid of the investigative judgment, you've got you, your belief in the end of time is going to end and change, and also also the whole concept of Mrs. White. So um, then I was showing that the commandments of God and the testament of Jesus Christ relating to the shut door could not be separated, and that the time for the commandments of God to shine out with all their importance and for God's people to be tried on the Sabbath truth was when the door was opened in the most holy place in the heavenly sanctuary where the ark is in which are contained the Ten Commandments. This door was not opened until the mediation of Jesus Christ was finished in the holy place on the sanctuary in 1844. So, Mrs. Wright is writing this, Crystal Care, Investigative Judgment, 1844, The Great Disappointment. It's all, it's all here. So in order, to, in order to get rid of investigative judgment, you have to get rid of Mrs. Wright. And that's what he did. And, then, and when you read Sran Christopher Fish's book and you go through all the references, people he refers to, he, he referenced Mrs. Wright like two or three times. In that whole thick book on Revelation, Two or three times. You think, wow, and it, there's all these other people who is referencing and referencing all people from all sorts of denominations. But our prophet, two or three times, which is sad. Let him, Branko Stevanovich in, in that book. Joel, come. My question did I understand you to say something crystal? I missed something and i wasn't sure to use the word crystal or not i was saying that what mrs white's writing about the sanctuary is crystal clear oh crystal clear thank you okay yeah. i wasn't saying there was some special new age crystals <laughs> no. okay so Pastor, is, is for that reason now many um, in many of our churches, including in my church, in the church that I I am a member, they don't want to hear anything about the spirit of prophecy. This is why the people of God is rejecting the spirit of prophecy. Yeah. You see, so it's... a simple answer is yes. The, the people believe that, or they're being taught that. Mrs. White is a very controversial figure. Her writing is very controversial. And as a church, we want to, we're wrapped up in the omega of apostasy where we want to be popular. And because we want to be popular, we're going to disregard or um, let go of those things which are controversial, like Mrs. White, okay, and the sanctuary, and health reform, and dress reform and perfection you know we just anything that's uncomfortable let's just get rid of it let's just have these comfortable truths which everybody likes okay 
So please, we're going to end, end on the next slide. Remember, Jesus describes himself as the key, is the key to what the church needs. Okay. Now, we are, we've lived through this period of time. What the church needed to do was to hold on to who Jesus Christ is. Remember, he's holy, and only holy things can go into the most holy place. Okay, he's true, he's genuine, he's, a, he's, he's fully God and fully man. And so oh, to go into the literal, the real presence of God, you needed to be a, um, a mediator between God and man, and that's Jesus Christ. Okay, and anything less than that. So the, this new description of Jesus was key to them going forward. Okay, so... Um, you know, let's see what time is. Can I hold you for like five minutes more and just finish this verse? Because we're halfway through verse eight, and you know, I don't want to finish halfway. Okay, let's go quickly. Um, for thou hast a, a little strength. Now, this is interesting because, and he said unto me, My grace is sufficient for thee, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. So, Paul sees his, well, let me finish. And most gladly, therefore, will I rather glory in my infirmities that the power of Christ may rest upon me. Therefore, I take pleasure in my infirmities, in reproaches, in necessities, in persecutions, in distresses, for Christ's sake. For when I am weak, then I am strong. Now, when you think about 1844, great disappointment. The church shrinks down. The group of people shrink down. Loads of people leave. And there's only a small amount of people that are left. And as a result of this, you know, at that time, they are mocked. They are ridiculed. It's in the middle of October in, in, in the Northeast. The growing season is over and done with. They have to go out and beg. And how embarrassing to beg. Why didn't you plant your field? <laughs> Where is Jesus? Press is going to send you. You know, that you can imagine the ridicule they went through, okay? In persecutions, in disappointments, in weakness. And why didn't you harvest your potatoes? Yeah, because they, they let them rot in the field. Some of them did. <laughs> there were 100,000 people there waiting for Jesus to come. When we see photographic, I mean, when we see, you know, paintings of it and stuff, you see a group of people, but you don't see a hundred thousand people. And when you think of when the disappointment happened, how all these people were scattered because they were so disappointed and there was such a small group left, I mean, you can kind of get in touch with a little bit about what we may go through because people who have lost people until I read it on my phone in four different places was never aware that the group that gathered out there on the rock waiting for Jesus to come was that big. Wasn't it? It wasn't. Yeah, hundred thousand people. Remember, they, they, they were spread all across the Northeast. It wasn't just Ascension, right? There was a group at Ascension, right? But all over New York, Maine. Yeah, that's a lot of people. Can you imagine you stole all your stuff and given everything away? <laughs> Suddenly you're just. Yeah. Let's check it out. Let's check it out. It has been, it has been speculated, speculated, we don't know for sure, that the majority simply gave up their beliefs and attempted to rebuild their lives. Some members rejoined their previous denominations. A substantial number joined the Shakers. Who are the Shakers? Okay, our researcher will find out and give you a definitive answer. And we'll give her about 90 seconds to do so. Okay. If there are but one or two in a place, they can, although few in number, so conduct themselves before the world as to have an influence which will impress the unbeliever with the sincerity of their faith. Now, you have to understand, she's saying this as a woman who's gone through the great disappointment. And she knows that there was only a small number left. 
Okay, Brother David. And research has revealed that the Adventists that left their potatoes in the field unharvested experienced food when others in the Northeast were starving because the potatoes they had harvested prior were all subject to a potato rot that destroyed the ones that were harvested early. But these that the Adventists took out of the ground after October 22, these were wonderful food and provided food for the saints through that winter. I can well imagine God doing that. <laughs> okay. The church at ancient Philadelphia was apparently... Okay, oh, the Shakers. Yeah, the Shakers actually turned out to be a really weird group that believe when God created the male and female that God is male and female. And then they went on to believe that God dwelt in the details of their work and the quality of craftsmanship. That's why we see those things often like shaker cabinets and stuff mm. like that. That's a quality of work, but it almost looks like that they don't, all their devotion, which no longer went to family or home was put into what they made. And they also have Sabbath day. <laughs> Lake is home to the world's only three remaining shakers. There's only three of them left in the world, but they keep the Sabbath. Only three in the world. But they do not believe in marriage, husband and wife. They, they, they dissolve the family. Yeah, that would have an impact on their numbers. <laughs> okay, the church at ancient Philadelphia was apparently neither large nor influential, but it was pure and faithful. Remember, we say it's going to be pure and faithful because of what happened with their shaking the direct disappointment that's what persecution does for you this philadelphia period of church history with its increased attention to god's word peculiarly particularly the prophecies of daniel and of the revelation and to personal godliness represented a much more encouraging picture than the preceding picture so they have a little strength they're small in number they're minute but they are pure. Okay? The last phrase, and has kept my word and has not denied my name. Okay, you disturbed it for a raccoon job. It is a church faith, it is a church faithful to God's word and, and Christ. It kept my word and did not deny my name. It has not fallen into compromise or apostasy. So this is Ranko Stevanovich, okay? Remember, he's writing, avoiding the great disappointment. Okay? Now, when you when you add the great disappointment into the story, it has a whole new level to, to the understanding. Okay? Okay? And this is Revelation chapter 10. This is John being told to eat this scroll. Do you remember that issue? Okay? And the scroll was Sweet in the mouth and bitter in the belly. We know that that was a, a prophecy about this time period, don't we? That this the news of the second coming of Jesus Christ was sweet in the mouth, exciting, really great, okay? But then it turned bitter in the belly, okay? Because disappointment. Okay, because disappointment. And then it finished off, Thou must prophesy again before many peoples and nations and tongues and kings. So this is the this is what John sees later on. Same time period, same time period, same things going to happen, and it's, and th that's related to great disappointment. Okay, the Millerites had to deal with with their own shattered expectations as well as considerable criticism and even violence from the public. Many followers had given up on their possessions in the expectations of Christ's return. Both Millerite leaders and followers were left generally bewildered and disillusioned. And at that time, it was very easy to deny the whole experience. When you're in the midst of the great disappointment and the, your whole world's falling around you, it's very easy to deny. You say, I, mean, I, I never really believed that. I was, I was just going along because my wife was going along. I just... Yeah, you know, it's very easy to deny what you have studied and researched before. It's very easy to do that. Okay, and but Jesus, but Jesus said to the church, "You have not denied my name." Okay. 
For we have not followed cunningly devised fables. That's what Peter says. When we made known unto you the power and coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, but were eyewitnesses of his majesty. And so Peter saying, listen, you know, my whole experience isn't, this isn't a story I made up. You know, this is a really small, clever, cleverly written story. This, I, I've, I've experienced it. And for the Miss, Mrs. White, when she writes about this experience, she's, she talks about how she couldn't deny the meetings and the experience and what she felt through the Holy Spirit at that time as a teenager. She couldn't deny that. It was, it was a, those genuine revival and brotherly love. That was for real. That was for real. She was, she was sorely disappointed, but she didn't deny the experience. She didn't deny the experience. She said, what I experienced was real. We've got to work it out. We've got to work it out. Pastor, is, we are not, is, uh, we are, uh, our church, I could say specifically, are, we are not in the stage of denying the Holy Spirit through the when we die when we deny the spirit of prophecy when we deny God's counsel through the uh, Sister White writings because uh, I read it the spirit of prophecies that said that that uh, we we start to deny in um, God's God's spirit of prophecy little by little we will we will be going forward we will go far from from god and i'm just thinking i'm just i have the thought that maybe it's happening now in our church sure yeah when we, if we deny the spirit of prophecy what we do is we cut off our right hand and we're fighting with one hand behind our back and we're going into a, a time of difficulty unprepared without valuable information that's going to help us and prepare us we are shooting ourselves in our own foot because god does nothing unless he reveals it to his servants and prophets we're going to end here because i was i just i was just flicking through and we've got several more slides jay he's just he's, he's getting ready to go, go. so we, we will come back to these cunningly devised fables next week next week we'll come back to cunningly devised fables okay Okay. Wow. Let us pray to close. We thank you, Father God, for knowing what's happening in the future and preparing your people to go through it. You've given us valuable information and you've proven yourself time after time after time we've seen it with all of the churches in all of these time periods how your description was spot on and how your advice was absolutely crucial for success and now you've given us the same again for the time period we live in in this latest CM period we pray the lord that we will follow your advice and we know the lord that some will reject it and there will be a shaking there will be a separation we pray, the Lord, that we will be kept in the faith, even if the main group of believers do not, will not tolerate us. Help us have to a faith that will not deny you. Help us not to choose the easy, popular path, but help us to follow you faithfully, no matter what happens. Let the results be what it is. Will it, what it be is the words of Mrs. White. And we fully agree with it. We thank you, dear Lord, for this time of worship and fellowship and sharing and study. We pray, dear Lord, that we'll continue to read and, and to learn. This is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.